Good evening and welcome to Midgard Rising, the Asatu podcast of the alt-right. I'm your host, League of the North, and I'm joined, as always, by Julian Wotenson. Hey. Jake Corwiner. Noticed by Senpai Nationalism. <laughs> and our exceptionally special guest for the evening, uh, Matt Flavel, who is the chair or head of the uh, Asatru Folk Assembly. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me on, guys. Oh, it's an honor to yeah, have it's, you. Yeah, it's incredible, actually. I mean, we've been working uh, working on this project for quite some time, and it's always been our goal to get some of the people who are um, helping to spearhead this movement um, for our people involved in what we're doing as well. So it's it's, it's just, it feels like the culmination of some of the work that we've been doing to have you on. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, Matt, if you would... Could you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and what your role is at the AFA and, um, you know, just introduce yourself for our listeners, presuming that people don't don't know anything about it. All right. Well, hello, guys. My name is Matt Flavel, and uh, I'm the Als Harry Argothi of the Als True Folk Assembly. Uh, I've, it's been my honor to hold that position now for a little over a year. I took over for Steve McNallan at uh, last year's Midsummer. I'm originally from Anchorage, Alaska, um, kind of traveled all around, but now I find myself you know, within driving distance of the Hoff out here in Northern California. Nice. So what is your, what, what would you say is like your, your main role? What, what does it mean to be um, in the position that you are? Well, um, the, way FA, the way the AFA is structured, the Alls Harry Argothi is both the, I guess, president of the the corporate body of the Austro Folk Assembly, but also the spiritual head of the organization. So it's it's my job to direct the mission of the AFA and make sure we, we're spiritually sound, we're staying on track, and uh, also to make sure that everything functions the way it should and that we, we can move forward with our mission in the best possible way that brings honor to uh, our ancestors, our folk, and our gods. So you're basically awesome. the pulp. I mean, Pope. <laughs> Uh, some people may say that I, I don't say that. Uh, I'm also assisted by the uh, the Witten, which is derived from an old English word, but it's basically a council of wise men. It's a a group of uh, AFA elders that that advise me and help me with the important responsibility running Astro Folk Assembly, and I'm very lucky to have those guys by my side. Here, here, awesome. Um, do you want to take a minute and just um, and just describe a little bit about the main activities of the Asa Through Folk Assembly and um, how how uh, it can work for and benefit people who are interested in um, the old ways and customs? Um, sure. There's a lot of things that the AFA does. Uh, as our ancestors looked at our faith, it wasn't just you know something people did on Sundays. Uh, Alistair True was, was much more than just a religious system. It was a way of life. So the AFA, in, in keeping with that mission, got a great many things we do. But the thing we focused on and do best is real-world Alistair True. And uh, you know, a, a lot of other groups are primarily online. And we try to make sure that we, you know, have a good online presence. But the thing that separates us is we, we really try to have folk interact in person. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that every week around the country, I get notifications of, you know, four, five, six different groups of Austro Folk Assembly members getting together, you know, at pub moots or at bloats or, you know, different gatherings to celebrate our gods and our ancestors. That's really something special we do. As a, as a national organization, we're able to have a unified message and basic understanding and basic belief structure across the world and certainly across the United States. Um, one of the things that we do as an organization that's helpful to people that may want to be involved is we connect people with others, we get together in groups, and we actually practice Alsa True. We don't spend a lot of time online debating it and you know arguing over obscure text. We spend time getting together forming community and honoring our gods and ancestors. And it's really a positive thing. Um, it's one of our biggest focuses as a group is to try to advance each other as individuals so that our group becomes stronger. Uh, the best thing we can do to affect change in the world is to 
to become that change that we want to see, to be the best versions of ourselves that we can. We've got a really good structure to help our members do that. We also have uh, trained and official Gothar that are able to you know, conduct not only our bloats and our ceremonies, but also give you know give good counsel to people who go through real life struggles. You know, we're trying to do those real things that a faith community does, and uh, I feel we're doing them very effectively. We're doing them better each day. Nice. Fantastic. I think the three of us kind of um, started out as keyboard warriors and still are to a to a slight extent. So it's <laughs> it's, ni it's nice to, it's nice to sort of um, get an example of how to do um, real world stuff. And I think we're all trying to move ourselves and our listeners towards that direction. Yeah, I mean well, that was um, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, that's a big part of what compelled us to do this, is because people don't grow up around the old ways. They kind of, they might discover it online. They might, you know, kind of agree with some of the theological aspects, but they're not sure how to practice it on a day-to-day -day basis. And part of what we try to do here is give them that guidance to be thinking about these things. I think there's a big need for that. That's something that I run across with people a lot is, you know, where do I start? What do I do? And we're really working on different ways to help make it more accessible to, to somebody to get involved in and start actually, you know, practicing Ausa True. Awesome. Um, well, you may know from listening to a couple of our episodes that uh, a big part of that for us right now and, and one of the ways that we've structured the show is to use one of the runes each episode uh, as a sort of a thematic um, element. Um, a bit of a, what we do is a little bit of a rune study and um, and use that as sort of a, yeah, a theme for the rest of the episode. So um, without further ado, the uh, rune that we're planning to study for tonight is Tear. Um, and I'll just jump into the usual, which is my reading of a chapter from Futhark, A Handbook of Rune Magic by Edward Thorson. Um, and then um, after that, we sort of, uh, we just get initial thoughts on the rune reading from each of our uh, hosts and guests and uh, let the conversation flow um, after that. So I'll just uh, jump right into it. This is from uh, Handbook of Rune ba Magic by Edward Thorson. The Tirun embodies the force ruled by the god Asatir. Tir is the Norse god of law and justice who governs proceedings at the Thing, the Germanic General Assembly. The Tir force is one of passive regulation. In northern mythology, it is this god who comes closest to a transcendental quality. These characteristics are exemplified by the major Tir myth in which the god sacrifices his hand or active abilities between the jaws of the Fenris wolf in order to save his uh, fellow Aesir from destruction. The Tivas, thus Tivas is the rune of self-sacrifice self and of kings and great leaders of the people. The word Tivas or Tyr in Old Norse is the exact cognate of Sanskrit Deus, Greek Zeus and Latin Jupiter. A threefold mystery is contained in Tivas, <coughs> justice, war and World, the world column. Certain aspects of all three concepts are intimately related in the runic cosmology. Tivas is principally the force of divine order in the multiverse and especially among mankind, but Tir is also important as a war god. This is because of the special judicial and spiritual qualities that were imparted to conflict by the ancient Northmen. An Old Norse word sums up this aspect quite well. Vapnadomar, judgment by arms or war. Combat was seen as a struggle between numinous forces in conjunction with physical ones. Both of these are considered to be extensions of the same ultimate source. The man or army with the most numinous power, which is developed by right and honorable past action, will be favored by Urlog to win the struggle. Tyr rules over the administration of this form of justice, so he is invoked for victory and is therefore an important war god. The aspect of the world column expressed by the Tyrune is that of the separator of heaven and earth. This separation creates the phenomenological quality and is therefore necessary to multiversal manifestation as we know it. This column maintains world order and protects humanity and the gods from the destruction that would come should the heavens energy and earth matter collapse into one another 
Tivas is represented by the Irmansul of the Saxons. This world column is the Axis Mundi and has its heavenly termination in the pole star. The Tirun is the mystery of spiritual discipline and faith according to divine law. It is the religious instinct in the individual and society. Tivats facilitates social integration and regulation according to the spiritual code of the Aesir. Keywords are justice, world order, order, victory according to law, self-sacrifice, and spiritual discipline. Um, would any of you guys like to make any comments on uh, the Tirun? Tivas? I mean, I think one of the first things we could go into is that tier myth specifically that is brought up, the one where the Fenris wolf is posing a threat to the Aesir and perhaps to the folk generally. And uh, there was some kind of binding chain that needed to be voluntarily placed on the wolf. And in return, uh, sensing that there may have been treachery, the wolf demands that Tyr's hand be placed in its mouth. Uh, now, of course, Tyr knows he's going to lose his hand, as it mentions. This is active ability. This is fighting capacity for a former war god. And in in its place, he takes a role of sort of legalism, uh, a type of order and a type of trust, you know, not minutia of tribal rules or something of that effect, but governing the order that exists between people and also through the act itself kind of the sacrifice that is embodied when one takes a certain uh, high caste position and is forced to sacrifice for the people that's that's a great point the the concept of the that that high caste that greater nobility to me um tear and and to was the rune is is emblematic of a of a certain masculinity that that is a a sort of sort of a, apart from the masculinity represented by thor it's it's a more um noble and formalized masculinity that is for the sort of higher of us um those those who seek to rule must as you as you said be willing to sacrifice and it's a very controlled and and restrained sort of masculinity but um we we have uh, something of a of an expert here um uh ch chime in matt if i said anything uh um uh apprentice like um what what, what do you think about it no, you guys are doing really good so far. I think the most important thing about uh, the Tivas mystery to me is the the symbol of order and that constant order that's that doesn't change, that's as reliable as the pole star. The order that's represented by the Ermansoul that keeps our cosmos itself in line and in reality functioning the way it ought to. How do you feel about sacrifice being a part of that? Well, I think that a lot of the bonds of our ancestors was always made by uh, by the giving of gifts and the proper exchange of things. And I think that sacrifice is very important to to maintain that relationship as as healthy and as balanced. You'll notice with the with the Gabo rune that it's perfectly balanced. Uh, that balance and that that right order of sacrifice and receiving the gifts keeps that order intact. So, um, two of the uh, the more high gods, Odin and Tyr, are both, um, to me, uh, gods who sacrifice. Um, however, uh, Tyr's was a slightly different sacrifice in that he himself gained absolutely nothing from it. Um, at, whereas Odin's sacrifice, um, it can be debated as to whether or not he he ever really intended to to give that that greater knowledge of the runes to to uh to the folk um or if if he was more on a quest um for personal power um do you do you see the the two the two um concepts of sacrifice as as uh as separate things that we should we should look to cultivate or or is sacrifice um, for either oneself or one's folk always good? Well, I think they're I think they're a little bit different in form. I think something very important to look at in Tears' sacrifice of his hand 
was that he's looking out for the interests of the folk, that maintaining the order and advancing our people was his ultimate goal. Um, I don't necessarily think that the All Father's sacrifice wasn't for the folk, but how the story is told is certainly for that personal advancement. But I think here we see kind of an early example of, of left hand, right hand path as far as acquiring benefits. And I think that to be perfectly balanced, you need to have that, you need to be a strong individual and you need to ultimately use your strength and your power as an individual to further your tribe, to further your folk. That's that's a good point. We actually did an entire episode on on trying to figure out where um, uh, Asatru was in the right hand path, left hand path continuum, and we did get into um, Odin's uh, sacrifice of self to self a little bit, and viewed that a little bit on the left hand path side of things. But we, I don't think we talked about Tyr's sacrifice, and and as you say, it was about maintaining the order and sort of making sure that that the clock's still running and and we can see that as as both the the most healthy um expression of the right hand path and that is to say that some sometimes the the cosmic order and the traditions that we have they're there for a reason and maintaining them is uh extremely important Um, one question that I had about Tyr uh, and the Tivas room is, is a connection that uh, comes to me from, uh, if you guys recall, when we spoke about uh, the building of the Wall of Asgard, right? And we, we spent a little bit of time talking about um, the idea of honor and... Uh, you know, in that story, we, we had a conversation about how the gods had... Um, essentially deceived the giant, the Jotun who had come to build the wall. Um, and they, they sort of found a way to, to worm their way out of the arrangement, right? And, and uh, undo the oath that was made about um, the, the building of the wall. And, um, and in this story, again, too, we have one of our gods uh, deceiving the Fenris wolf. You know, he fully intends not to... Uh, you know, he, he knows that they, they all know that they're lying to the Fenris wolf and deceiving him. Um, so my question, I guess, is, is about our concept of honor and whether this is, you know, do we see honor as something that is exclusive to our in-group or is, or how does, how does this concept of honor play out when uh, confronting an enemy and um, is honor something, uh, you know, do we perceive honor as exclusively that which benefits our tribe or is there something more to it? And I'd, I'd like to know what everybody thinks on that. Starting with Matt, of course. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> that's complex with our, with our myths. We have to always remember that they're not just really big, supersized comic book humans. It's not like, you know, the gods are one group of people and the giants are a different group of people having a very mundane conflict. Our gods are the spirit forces of the consciousness of our folk. And the giants are, you know, beings of chaos and beings of untamed natural forces. It's not like one guy dealing with, you know, a gentleman from a different nation or a different tribe. I think that this, the tale of Tear is certainly one that teaches us a lot about honor. And there's trickery afoot, but one of the most important things of the story is he makes a deal and he follows through with it by offering up his hand. I mean, he kind of he kind of pays that price in which honor demands. Do you think if he could have gotten his hand out that it would have been uh, still preferable not to do so? I think perhaps. I think as we talked earlier about the gift cycle and maintaining that cosmic order, I think paying that cost is exhibiting the right action that uh, Thorson talked about. By getting victory and, and a more powerful Orlog by conducting consistent right action, I think that's very important. 
Hmm. It's interesting. And I mean, it's also interesting to note that uh, the latter form of Tyr, as beyond simply a war god, as a god of order and sacrifice, comes out of this. So you could say that the whole conflict sort of impeded, or not impeded, uh, induced a, uh, what is, a very strong personal development, which, of course, reflects well on our people. So I I always um, viewed viewed this as a story that sort of indicated, um, and again, like like what he said, it's a little more complex than how I I was previously thinking about it. But the concept of in group and out group morality and how that conf conflicts with the concept of universalism, um, when when you have a universal set of set of set of rules and morality that that you sort of export to those who would do you harm such as the Fenris wolf then then you sort of um you you make yourself slave to to concepts and that that can be used against you when no one else really uh, adheres to that that sort of universal system of morality so um i i always viewed christianity and and uh judaism and 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 religions like that the, the abrahamic religions as inherently damaging to europeans because it forced us to to sort of submit ourselves to to an external and foreign morality that turned out to be a slave morality um this is how however Oosh. It, yeah yeah but, but there as as you say there there are there are there are fundamentals in the universe too um such as if if you if but but then again this this is not so so much a moral sacrifice he had to make this was just um sort of a, a law the laws of the universe as it re, as it relates to strength and weakness and and if you want to get something out of someone um you have to sort of force them to sort of ante up and and if you if you sacrifice or if you break your oath then and if they have the strength to force you to lose your ante or in this case your hand then you lose your hand it's not it's not a moral um question it's just it's just adhering to the laws of nature and and the universe i mean is this sort of going back to the concept that there really are no universal human rights there are only the rights which you yourself can secure yeah um that's that's my my sort of position on it though um what what do you what do you think about that basic um duality matt uh on on one hand you have universal um moral norms and and human rights and on the other you have this sort of nietzschean um uh will to power uh where 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 do you think um uh what what sort of moral uh, framework do you think is most healthy for our people on that spectrum? Well, I think something that's very important as a place to start is the word honor itself. We've decided, you know, in modern times that honor means your personal code of right and wrong, but it originated as the value that your society placed upon you. Honor was something you received. You were given an honor. You were honored by your folk. It wasn't a personal code. It was the value in which your tribe placed in you. And certainly paying a sacrifice to protect, you know, to protect order and to protect the realm of the gods is an honorable act, an act that your tribe would deem worthy of an honor. Um, I think looking at it from that perspective, there, I don't believe in universal codes of conduct. I don't believe in, in universal anything. I think that's disrespectful to not only us but them as well yeah um i think uh that that could also be a jumping off point into talking about what it means to be folkish and why the afa is folkish itself because um as, as you say honor is something that's given to you by your people by your folk and I don't think you can sort of receive honor through some sort of, you know, global 
concept. I, I don't think the United Nations can give you honor. It's just people who know you and who respect you who can give you honor. And that, that sort of gets into um, Dunbar's number, 150 people, I think, where, where you can only really know and have empathy for 150 people. And that's where, for most of our genetic history, we evolved in those sort of um, small tribes. And I mean, the, it, it's a big, big world, so we can't really conceive of just 150 people as our folk um, because we are descended from from a, a relatively small stock um, and, and our ancestors had many, many children and created us. So I think having brotherhood amongst all Europeans um, is good. And, and so I, I will accept honors from you know someone in california or or texas even even if they're not really in my little dunbar's number but i don't i don't feel i can really accept um uh the moral judgments of people who don't share um common ancestry with me or or a common culture with me um well, this is why this is why i brought up the um the building of the wall of osgard because this same question came up when when we were talking about that right and and, and how uh, the Aesir sort of schemed their way out of fulfilling that bargain as well and and i i agree with julian that that it comes down to um, a totally different sense of morality that um, I, I think that our is right for our people, which is that that which uh, advances the interest of our people is noble and good, and you know really, um, you know preserving you know your word and oaths with outsiders or people who would do you harm if they had an, uh, an opportunity to do so um, i don't think that those none of that is virtuous if it results in your own downfall right like if if the gods in that case in in the building of the wall of is, of uh, asgard you know if they had just gone completely strictly <coughs> by the letter of their agreement and allowed freya and the sun and the moon to all be uh, taken by this jotun i mean how would that be remembered in the scheme of things um you know I, it certainly wouldn't be honorable either and uh um you know to allow these things to fall into enemy hands or um to allow your ans your your progeny and uh forebears to suffer you know on account of s preserving some type of um you know propriety in that way i don't think would be considered an honorable position hmm I think it's incredibly nuanced and there's a scale of values. And I think that in general, being truthful and being, you know, honoring your oaths and honoring the agreements you make is, is certainly a good thing. And I think we'd, we'd all agree on that. But the survival of your people and your folk and the advancement of your folk should be your paramount concern. And uh, you've got to do what you've got to do to, to reach that end and to protect everyone. Um, you know, who wouldn't tell a lie to save the life of their child, for instance? Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't make it doesn't make lying good, but it makes the alternative much worse. The existence of our people is not negotiable. Right. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, deception can be a tool, right? And Lord knows, I mean, um. Deception has certainly been used against us as a people through, you know, many millennia. Um, and it is it is on in part because of our, uh, you know, our concepts of morality and noble virtue that this has been able, you know, that this has been um, taken advantage of. So, you know, I, I think I, I really do think it's an important step for us to take to um, you know, to move beyond that sense of like strict virtue, um, in terms of truthfulness or, or uh, uh, you know, and, and the ability to use deception where necessary, it's just something we've got to overcome. Um, or our leaders do anyway, uh, in terms of helping to direct us. So, yeah, yes and no. I mean, I, I know I've, I've supported, um, sort of tacitly the idea of, of white tiki in the past, sort of semi, semi jokingly, but, um, 
I, I I kind of alluded to this on our on our last uh, um, symbol in that uh, Donald Donald Trump, even if he's playing like eighty uh, eight D chess or whatever with with uh, DACA by saying, "Oh, let's let's do DACA," you know, w- there's there's something about you know scheming and double talk that I think our people find inherently dishonorable if it's if it's done to to a certain degree i mean i mean a little a little tweak here a little tweak there if a uh, uh, white lie here or there if it if it gains your people power and honor and prestige and respect is good but at the end of the day you have to be able to take your mask off and say this is absolutely what i believe in this is who i am this is the honorable thing to do. You sort of have to sort of present a no nonsense sort of chat approach to things. Otherwise, you just sort of become the the lie that you're pretending to be. I think that's extremely important, and I wouldn't want anyone to take away from this conversation that it's okay to go, you know, lie your way into into advancing yourself. Um, there's a cost for these lies. There's a cost for deception, as Tear paid with his hand. It's not okay. It's not. It's not necessarily a good thing to do. But often, you know, in these circumstances, perhaps it's it's the better of the choices available, and it's a sacrifice to his personal luck that he was willing to make for the folk. Um, within the in group, you're you're known by your reputation, and if your reputation is for someone who's not truthful, then within your own tribe, you won't be trusted. And uh, yeah, there there's always some sort of sacrifice to be paid and recently I've I've been using for for other things the concept of immoral immoral acts sort of you end up giving away a piece of your soul. Um now now any any sort of immoral act you do, you probably are doing that a little bit. You're giving away a little a little bit of yourself, a little bit of your prestige or honor or respect. However, if the if the outcome of that act gives your people and your family and your folk a great amount of honor, you will receive back more than than what you did. So there, there's sort of a sort of moral calculus going on there, um, I think. I think we're spending a lot of time focusing on the exception instead of the rule, though. And are people wanting to be upstanding? to uh, abide by our noble virtues and to be known as virtuous people that hold to their word. I think that's fundamental, and I think that's also part of the mystery of, of Tivas when we look at that cosmic order. Us abiding by our word and us being morally upright people is what upholds that world column. It's the, you know, these are things that are truths that hold steady as the pole star to keep our cosmos ordered. And when we start messing with that over much, uh, it throws things into chaos. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree and, with that. And with regards to uh, Orlog, which was mentioned earlier, I think that also ties back into the concept of self-sacrifice. And it's something you can see in these moral paradigms, but it's also, I would say, something you can see in your everyday life, which is more or less you're always going to do what you've always done. Of of course, there there is summoning of the will. There are improvements to yourself, but... What I'm saying is that, like, if you are constantly working towards right and honorable action, you know, if you're maintaining uh, physical fitness, intellectual wellness, uh, moral uh, goodness, then you're going to receive uh, a sort of, for lack of a better term, uh, a bit of luck from your ancestors and from the holy powers, which assist your own person and your own folk. Um yeah, again, going back to the Orlog concept. So, um, I don't, traditionally, we, we just kind of um, move move uh, move on from the uh, the rune concept into more general conversation, um, but I'd actually like uh, like to give Matt a, a final word and an opportunity to, to say whatever he would like to say about um, a tear in this rune and what one can uh, take from it, the power that one can take from it. And and from the God and and how we should sort of live um, our lives through that example. I just had one more question before, like a final word on Tivas. I actually have something else I'd like to raise as well. Well, we've so, got we still got time in the first hour, so 
Yeah, we're we're doing great. So um, my the, the insight that I wanted to ask about is just thoughts on how um, so so Tyr sacrifices his hand in this uh, in this act of preservation of his people, but then part of the consequence of that is um, the fact that he then is uh, you know unable to take up arms uh, at, at the final battle at Ragnarok uh, at least as effectively and I wonder if you have any specific insights on that like the di the dichotomy there and the, the um, you know the concept of you know what's being talked about here and what's lost you know is it in terms of short-term game versus long-term um, strategy and so on well the myth that we have is fairly late in the game uh, that we get and I, I wonder further into antiquity what detail we may have had on the story that we don't have by the time that uh, Snorri records it um, one thing that I think is important and I think it ties into our, our conversation about you know, deception and other things earlier Tyr sacrifices a bit of himself. He sacrifices something very valuable of himself in order for to preserve the greater good of you know our gods and ultimately our folk by binding this this creature of absolute destruction, um, a creature that would go on in in Ragnarok to to devour the All Father. So. I think it's it's very important that there is a cost associated with it, and that sacrifice in that sense that you know taking care of your folk or doing the right thing isn't always free, and it isn't always something that you know you're not going to suffer a cost for. And his willingness to suffer that cost for his people is a powerful example for all of us to be able to to give of ourselves selflessly so that our tribe our folk can advance and be safe absolutely and um one thing i was wondering about if you don't have anything else on that league oh i'm good you can go ahead okay yeah um now part of what we're seeing with the tiwaz rune or with the tier concept is sort of a a sense of karma to put it uh, colloquially, you know, uh, what goes around comes around, you know, you, uh, your actions, your warlog determine to some degree uh, the fate of yourself. And it's mentioned specifically that armies would invoke this for victory. However, I would, that seems somewhat contradictory, I would say, to the Odinic mystery where, you know, uh, the the brave, the courageous, the strong, and the, uh, the selfless are often cut down in battle to to ascend to Valhalla. Um, Matt, do you have any any uh, insight as to how maybe these two can be reconciled? <clears throat> um. No, I'm trying to give it the thought that it deserves because I think it's a very good question. Um, I think, I don't know. I think that's one of the, the I guess, ironies of heroism is the more heroic you are and the more heroic your actions, the more you put yourself at risk. Um, our ancestors were they were big gamblers that way. They'd play games of chance. They would test their luck. And I think that you find in a lot of tales about Odin, him, you know, capitalizing on people when they lose that roll of the dice. But I think we often forget about all the times the dice are rolled that they're victorious. <laughs> um, I mean, a great champion eventually loses his belt at some point, but that doesn't negate all of the victories he's gotten to get to that point. Defeat at the end of a long string of victories doesn't negate the victories that you've you know achieved to get there. Hmm. That's true. So one, just just to uh, sort of try and tie tie together some of the concept we've been talking about. One one of the more. Uh, uh, fundamental concepts of to us is is that of justice, and I think when we think think of justice, um, 
the way to think about it is is just as surrounding sort of the more primal truths of of what is is righteous and honorable action the the less the less context dependent um i i've i've also read tiwas is a, is a sort of linked with with the north star and it is it is the star on upon which all all others sort of uh uh surround um and and again th this is another interesting way of contrasting um uh tier tier with odin cuz odin is is you know a, a sorcerer he's he's a very seems a little more context dependent his his justice is a little bit more of a um a personal or or, or focused justice and and tiwaz is a more um a more let's see i i don't want to say big picture guy cuz cuz he doesn't have have uh i mean odin odin is definitely a big picture guy um but but he seems m more likely to be tied to uh eternal uh truths and and moral truths would you say that's correct uh, absolutely i think that's one of that's the most standout thing to me about t the tivas mystery is the constancy of that of that order i really like it the reference to the pole star comes from the uh the Anglo-Saxon rune poem, and that really rings true to me. Um, that the consistent basis of that, the fact that it doesn't change, I think it's a really important takeaway for us living in the times that we live in, because moral relativism is, you know, that's the in thing now, and you know, we've we've as a culture seem to have dissolved all notions that our grandparents would have understood about right and wrong, or you know just basic biology of men being men and women being women and all these things that we took as as truths since the dawn of time are now being challenged and you know being claimed their social constructs or whatever else looking to and being inspired by this rune and by you know by this god i think helps us navigate through all the mist of all of this chaos around us I think that's one of the most important things about the concept of the pole stars was used for navigation. And it was something that, you know, if you're lost, you could look to the night sky and navigate by. I think looking to these sacred concepts that have been true since the dawn of people, since the dawn of our folk, is what's going to get us through the moral confusion that we find ourselves in and that our folk are surrounded with every day, sticking to those values that are eternal for us. I think that's the most powerful thing about this rune to me those those eternal eternal values um sort of an open-ended question um what what would you uh define those values as <clears throat> like to list them yeah yeah i mean i don't i don't know if you have a list but like like for instance um i mean the 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 Christian Bible has you know the Ten Commandments, um, and, well, and we we have the nine nine noble virtues, um, and and I I always I I think I think when when you talk about about eternal values, I I see it, you know like Christianity some of their eternal values I I see as as not necessarily eternal values for us for European peoples. Um, so I'm I'm not I'm not sure what your your view is that because I I do believe that different um, uh, ethnicities different races um, because they evolved differently uh, and have different gods they do have um, to me different moral values which which is a uh, I'm I'm still trying to to tease out in my own mind the difference between a moral value a folkish value and just uh, eternal law of nature, which, you know, even, you know, animals must adhere to. Well, that's one of the things that, that's why I use the word eternal as opposed to universal. Just because the value's timeless doesn't mean it's applicable to all different groups of, you know, races of people on planet Earth. I don't, you know, I don't claim to know the value system of other races of people that aren't our own. And I don't claim to tell them what those are for them. 
But the values that our folk have always held to since the dawn of time revolve around certain natural principles and they don't they don't ebb and flow they're they're perhaps interpreted differently in different circumstances but they can serve as a as a guiding light i think our nine noble virtues are a very important um guide to that mm-hmm. i think one of the differences when you say you know you talk about how christians values don't um they don't ring true with you and, and you would would uh, take issue with their their universal moral values i think the difference is that theirs are life denying where ours are life affirming ours are born from nature and theirs are a negative reaction to that nature so i think they're you know they're almost polar opposites of one another i think the values of of courage truth honor fidelity discipline hospitality self-reliance and industriousness i think those are are very good you know, very good things we can hang our hat on and, and find throughout our history and hopefully throughout the course of our history into the future with our descendants to be values that our folks can, can stand by. Yeah. And I, I think those are pretty, pretty perfectly contrasted with the, with the, you know, do not covet this, do not covet that, you know, and, and the, the Abrahamic religion seemed to be very focused on, you know, submission of, of your will to a greater, higher power. But all, all of, all of our, our virtues, you know, are telling you how to be strong for, for greater purposes than yourself. It's not all about, you know, a sort of, um, nihilistic individualism, but in order to be a, a successful member of the tribe you do have to be a courageous and honorable person you do have to be industrious and and self-reliant and able to show hospitality and self-discipline very true and on that note should we maybe uh, offer a little olive branch to christians who you know have some of the same political ideas as we do I'd, I'd like for us to get that out there because this will be a lot of people's first time listening. Yeah, yeah, and I'll I'll do that. Uh, um, ac- actually, I may I may have changed my my symbol, but but uh, I think um, uh, for 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 better or worse, um, Christianity has had a lot of uh, our our European values sort of superimposed upon it. Um, and, and I think those who, who live, uh, Christian lives uh, do have a sort of reverence for these values that many atheists do not. So strangely enough, even though we may, you know, um, have certain opinions about the, uh, the origins of Christianity and, and the, the, uh, the, the benefit of having a sort of, um, uh, universal egalitarianism, which, you know, other peoples can sort of latch on to and claim um descendants from they they there are christians who are invaluable to to your to europeans and fighting um the 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 more decadent and and uh insidious aspects of of modern culture so i and and i i would the to, since we are a semi-political podcast, um, uh, recently uh, Thomas More um, won in Alabama, and he is uh, as Christian as they come. But um, they, we do have a lot of overlap in just what makes someone honorable is sort of being able to fight for your own people. And to do that through value, through values that that only the the noble can sort of easily adhere to. So, you know, I think that um, you know, Julian, you were at Charlottesville, and um, one of the statements from the last Daily Show that um, you know brings this home is just that you know when you were on the ground together at Charlottesville, it didn't matter. You know, none of these um, disagreements mattered because you were standing together as brothers. And, um, you know, these are th- these types of um, spiritual arguments. Again, this is what they spoke about on the Daily Show the other day. Is that without our um, the secure the security of our people, 
um, we can't have these kinds of arguments or disagreements because without Europeans, none of this matters. So, um, uh, yeah, of course we, when, when, um, when when shit hits the fan we're going to stand together with with all of our european brothers regardless of what spiritual system they're following but um basically yeah, i think um go for it jake i was just gonna say whatever uh whatever criticisms we have of christianity whatever critiques we have should not be interpreted as a below the belt attack on the religion or an attack certainly not on our brothers who adhere to it I think that, um, of course, the reason that, I mean, we've, we've kind of got a celebratory reason for spelling all of this out. I don't know if Matt is aware of this either, but um, we did just get word that um, our show has been picked up by the, the TRS radio network. Um, and so I believe that this episode will be our first one um, syndicated with, with TRS. Um, and so, of course, um, there are shows of every type on the network of, from, you know, to sort of satisfy, you know, every type of, um, you know, content that people would like to consume, um, including Christian podcasts <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, in our political movement, the greater political movement, you know, we are standing side by side with, um, you know, with Christians and atheists and whomever else um, wants to help preserve and protect our people so um it's it's with uh, i think great joy that we have the the um you know the the ability right now to um you know just to, to say those words of solidarity and um uh, you know express the fact that we we too um would you know we look forward to standing side by side with all of these people in the future so um on that note N that 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 said i was going to say there is something um uh for for those uh, for those among in our movement who are uh sort of still spiritually searching i think there is something to be said for a a religion that is not only rooted in 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 your ancestry and what your ancestors practiced and the values they practiced but one which is explicitly folkish um and matt i was wondering if you could talk about uh the afa and it being folkish and what um being folkish means to you and and how you see that as contrasting with the um universalist movements not only in in Asatru, but um as as a more uh wider movement I'm I'm really glad that you asked that. I wanted to speak on this Christian thing for a second before we move on, and I think it ties in. Um, I'll say this. Traditional Christians that stand by traditional Western values, uh, the Austro Folk Assembly has much more in common with those people than we do against, and you can't see my air quotes right now, but universal Austro or eclectic, um, you know, eclectic melting pot paganism. Uh, I think that those traditional Western values, we can argue about where they come from, but I think that they do give a commonality to a lot of us, and, and I'll certainly acknowledge that. Um, as far as the Austro Folk Assembly and, and why we're folkish, it never really occurred to anyone not to be. The concept of universalist Austro is a, a very new one. Uh, indigenous faith has always been inherently folkish to the group that, you know, the group that spawned it. Um, un universal religion is a fairly, fairly unique concept to the Abrahamic faiths. And uh, other than that, any, any religion that's, a, that's an indigenous religion of a people has always been inherently folkish. Um, the AFA, when it was first founded, the original AFA back in the 1970s, there wasn't a question of, you know, should we be folkish or should we be universalist? Um, the, the one simply didn't enter the picture. And it's, it's very strange to a lot of the old timers to see that there's been this whole universalist heresy that's developed. Um, yeah, the, the, the folkish concept is, is very inherent to who I am and certainly who we are as the Asatru Folk Assembly. And it, it wasn't a conscious choice that was made. It wasn't a you know, a, a political decision to take a stand on something. It was, 
the very literally the very blood in our veins calls out to be folkish and honor our ancestors it's at the very root of of anything that we do and i i truly don't understand how any uh any universalist ouster i i don't understand where they're coming from and i don't understand how they think our folk relate to our gods well so with heim heimdall's black so <laughs> I, was, I was just gonna say you don't so you don't think that uh heimdall should be played by a black guy <laughs> uh no absolutely not and i think that you know if we had white guys playing indigenous african deities i think it would be shocking and offensive and uh not sure why the same rules don't apply but we all know they don't i'm sure why the it, same rules don't apply it, ac it actually was shocking and, and offensive when they did the the gods of egypt thing oh my the the amount of salon and huffpo articles that came out everyone was very butthurt it was just just absolutely in the front regardless even though you know d recent dna tests have shown that you know egyptians were indo-european too so they weren't even african but still <laughs> mm, so that, that makes me think of um you know one thing i'd love to pick uh, matt's brain about a little bit is um i think we'll save this for after the break because we're coming up pretty soon on it but um you know, how he sees Asatru as a uh, spiritual system fitting in with like the greater, you know, pagan ideologies and uh, rooted in Indo-European uh, systems. So maybe he wants to think on that for a bit and we'll get into it after the break. Um, did any of you guys have anything else you want to address before we go off? Sounds good. I'm good. Okay, cool. So, um, I know that we Volkmom has planned to do a uh, a segment for us tonight. I believe it's on uh, one of the the herbs, which she calls wonderful stinging nettle. I've never thought of stinging nettle as anything other than a pest, so I'm looking forward to, to finding out what its um, medicinal and other other uses are. Um, I I'm not sure whether or not I'm including a Wardruna track tonight. It really all depends on whether we are in fact able to post um, on the TRS network this this episode, um, because we we will in the future have to avoid using copyright music. So uh, we are going to be putting out the word to our listeners and anybody who's got any kind of talent and wants to produce provide some kind of um, uh, music or other. Um, you know, different content for us to share on the show. Um, up to this point, we've been using, you know, the, the different uh, tracks on the runes by w the band called Wardruna. But of course, that stuff is all copyrighted. And um, now that we've gained syndication, we've, we've, we've really got to just work on avoiding any kind of uh, copyright issues. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if we will have that Wardruna track for you guys tonight. Um, if not, what I would say you should do is right after the Volkmom segment is just pause your recording and go to YouTube um, and listen to the Wardruna track for Tear. Um, it's it's still great uh, content and um, intellectual property and really sets the sets the mood for <coughs> the rune itself. So um, still st still steal your shit, just don't do it through us. That's the idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, we just can't be responsible for it. That's all. <laughs> Uh, it's unfortunate because I've really enjoyed playing badass uh, metal, you know, uh, pagan metal music at the end of each show, but uh, I think I'll have to probably skip that from now on, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so uh, hang in there, guys, and we will see you all right after the break. Good evening, Volkmom here. 
I hope you've all been able to take some time to be in nature this past week, to feel the soil on your bare feet, the sun on your skin, to nourish your soul by gazing at the blue sky, or perhaps training yourself to notice the variation in the leaves and bark of the trees around you. Tonight the moon is waxing and the air is chilly. I'm sipping on a cup of warm nettle and mint tea. Stinging nettle plant, an ancient European plant ally, is what I'm here to talk about tonight. Culpepper said, Nettles are so well known that they need no description. They may be found by feeling in the darkest night. If you've ever been stung by nettles while venturing off trail, you would remember it. I remember as a child playing by the creek and carelessly running through a tall, dense patch of them, only to find myself seconds later stunned by a mysterious, agonizing stinging from head to toe. Perhaps that was an abrupt way for me to be introduced to this old healer. Perhaps it was a necessary initiation into a life of herbal study. Nevertheless, in my adult years, I've become very well acquainted with nettle, or the Latin, urtica dioica. Nettles are native throughout Europe and grow in the Americas and other places, usually around three feet tall, but potentially reaching up to six feet. They have square stems and deep green toothed leaves. You can't miss the hairy stingers covering the stems and leaf bottoms. The flowers are greenish yellow. You can find nettles growing along waterways, in woodlands, and even in city parks and alleys. They often grow near dock or at old home sites or barnyards. You can also purchase dried nettle leaf online, which may become necessary if you use it as much as we do. This plant has too many uses to list. It is hands down my favorite herb. And while the fresh plants can deliver a sting, this herb is safely used when cooked or dried, removing all trace of the ability for the stinging hairs to inject their formic acid. Indeed, the cooked leaves and young shoots are a delicious vegetable, and the tea is ever so nourishing and delightful. I always add a bit of raw milk and sometimes a bit of honey, and occasionally a pat of butter, and then it's practically a meal. Beyond these points, nettle is full of medicinal and nutritional benefits. For thousands of years, as nettles sprouted forth from the earth in spring, our ancestors would seek them as one of the first green foods of the new year. They contain high levels of calcium, magnesium, iron, phosphorus, manganese, silica, and iodine. They also provide chlorophyll and vitamin C. But to me, the most exciting food fact here is that they're 10% protein, more than any other vegetable. Medicinally, nettles are most well known on our homestead as a pregnancy tonic. We don't need expensive synthetic supplements or prepackaged vitamins when we tap into the amazing gifts the plants offer all around us. Nettles strengthen and tone the uterine, wall, and thigh muscles needed for childbirth. Nettles are also a wonderful supportive herb for the adrenals. If you drink a lot of caffeine, your adrenals are taxed. Supplementing with a cup of nettle tea now and then can offer healing. Eating cooked nettle greens and drinking the tea promotes healthy skin and nails, thicker and shinier hair, and you can even rinse your hair in the tea to help it grow. This herb is also diuretic, helping restore kidneys and bladder and also useful for lung ailments and to nurture the liver. The stings of the plant actually have a unique remedy. They've long been used intentionally to improve circulation and in cases of arthritis and even atrophy and palsy. From Maud Greaves Herbal, she quotes Camden from Britannica. The Roman soldiers brought some of the nettle seed with them and sowed it there for their use to rub and chafe their limbs. When through extreme cold, they should be stiff or benumbed. Having been told that the climate in Britain was so cold that it was not to be endured. 
While the stings of our nettles last minutes, or at most several hours, there is a tropical species that releases a sting so painful that it can last for years. Nettle root is also touted by some to be a testosterone boost for men. This plant was surely one of the most revered by our ancestors, truly life-sustaining. The nettle plant is said to have derived its common name from noodle or needle because this plant supplied the thread to our Scandinavian and Germanic folk before the introduction of flax. Its fiber is similar to hemp and flax and it was used for the same purposes from making fine cloth to even sailcloth, sacking, and rope. Flax and hemp bear southern names and were introduced to the north to replace nettle. Again, Maud Grieve quotes the poet Campbell, who, complaining of the little attention paid to nettle in England, tells us, In Scotland, I have eaten nettles, I have slept in nettle sheets, and I have dined off a nettle tablecloth. The young and tender nettle is an excellent pot herb. The stalks of the old nettle are as good as flax for making cloth. I have heard my mother say that she thought nettle cloth more durable than any other species of linen. You can harvest nettle shoots in spring and fall when they send a second flush of green growth up just before the heavy frosts come. Wear gloves or practice picking them without getting stung. It can be done, but it takes skill. Fresh leaves only need a tiny bit of cooking and can be eaten plain or added to quiche, goat cheese, or made into a cream sauce. Dried leaves can be made into a tea, which can be enjoyed safely in abundance by the whole family. Nettle beer is an ancient traditional European preparation called small beer and made with fresh nettle tops, dandelion leaves, brown sugar, and yeast. This would have been consumed at mealtimes as a mildly alcoholic tonic beverage. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this segment. Questions or comments, email volkmom at protonmail.com. May you be steadfast in your struggle. May you be of healthy body and mind. Blot on Boden. It is for this we fight. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for uh, for hanging in there with us, and uh, thank you to Volkmum for the excellent segment on stinging nettle. And I hope everybody took the opportunity to uh, pause the recording and go check out the, that Wardruna talk um, song I was talking about before the break. Um, we're back again with uh, Matt Flavel, Fla Flavel. Sorry about my pronunciation there. Um, from the Asatru Folk Assembly. Can you say your title again for us, Matt? Um, I'm sure it may be the first time that people have heard that title, and maybe you could tell us exactly what is the direct translation of it. You bet. All's hair yargothi. And it's kind of from the root all's, like everyone's uh, hair yar, the warriors, like the all warriors or all warring gothi. Okay. And a gothi, I mean... And a gothi, just... basically, uh, for any listeners that aren't familiar with House of True, a gothi is basically a, a, a priest of, of the, the Germanic gods. Um, comes from the same root as, as goth, or the words for gods. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's something that um, I know that a couple times it's come up on our show where um, we've, we've sort of come to the conclusion that we wish we had a, a gothi um, available to us to sort of answer some of our ponderings. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, that's the whole point of what we're doing is to sort of draw more people in and, um, and introduce them to some of the, the customs and the ideas uh, in a sort of user-friendly kind of way. So um, I think- And now we got um, you on speed dial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now we got you on speed dial, so that's awesome. But um, we, okay, so there's a couple questions. I handed out a question I wanted to ask uh, before the break about the, you know, Asa through in the perspective, the greater perspective of, of Indo-Aryan um, spiritual consciousness. Um, 
But I think the first thing I want to address now after the break is um, uh, what, like, you know, we presume, I mean, and the whole reason that we're doing this is because we want to welcome people in who may be sort of on the fence or are considering these ideas for the first time, or maybe they've, you know, they've got a feeling like it's something that uh, resounds with them, um, but they have no idea how to... <clears throat> bring this into their lives. And, um, you know, for many of us, you know, we're growing up or we live in places where there are no other practitioners of Asa through especially. Um, and they might be the one person that they know or the one family that they know who are considering doing these things and, and learning more. And um, I guess, you know, I'm speaking from personal experience. I mean, I'm I'm by myself out here. I joined the the AFA. I, I uh, and you know I've got a membership going, um, and I've tried to branch out a little bit here and there. And but still, I remain, as far as I'm aware, like one of the only people in my region that is practicing. Um, and so for me, the 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 whole thing has been sort of to make it a family ritual because I, you know, of course, my first. Um, uh, the immediately the people that are immediately available to me are my own my own children and my wife and we can practice this stuff together and and form our own little uh, you know community. Um, of course, what we want to do is sort of reach out and find more people that can form a, a broader network. But I think it starts with the individual, right? Like it's going to start with that family or that one person who is looking at the world and seeking spiritual answers. Um, and has maybe you know maybe they've read into the eddas a little bit or or uh, maybe they've sort of dipped a toe in some of um stephen mcnallan's writings or uh you know maybe all they've done is sort of um you know read some of the pagan general posts on 4chan and like really that's all they know of of our um customs and the religion and so I, my question, I guess, to you, Matt, is like s someone who's on the cusp like that, someone who's who's coming to us through for the first time and considering um, bring getting more involved. What can you tell to that person? You know, what does the us through folk assembly have to offer that person? And what do you think their first steps are if they're just by themselves sort of in the wilderness? You know, how do they how sh what do you think that the is is going to make it, um, you know, make the most comfortable, um, you know, bringing themselves and their families into the fold. Oh, well, there's a couple different answers I have for that. Uh, one of them may seem a little bit self-serving, but I genuinely think it's the best plan. I would encourage anyone who finds themselves there, look into the Austro Folk Assembly, go to our website. If you agree with our declaration of purpose and our statement of ethics, then join up and uh, you know even before that step if you want talk to your folk builder we have a map of where we have folk builders and we've got them throughout the United States and at different parts of the world and reach out to them and they can give you some guidance on what to do or where there's groups getting together doing things I can't emphasize this enough but this religion has always been a communal religion it's been you know the faith that was celebrated by your tribe and your your clan and your community and i think getting out there and actually interacting with folks is the best way to really feel what it's all about and luckily you know it, they may not be everywhere but if you're willing to drive a little bit you can get to an afa event you can get to an afa meetup and you can actually meet some of these folks and i think that's the best way um the other option is if that's not the route you want to go and you don't want to join the AFA or it's, you're just not ready yet, which is cool. I think the first thing you should do is reach out to your ancestors, you know, make in your own quiet place, whatever you've got. If you've got an altar in your house, if you've got a special place out in the woods, go, you know, raise a beer to your ancestors and just try to reestablish those connections and really focus on that. And I think that helps get your life get your life right and you in a spot to really receive the truths of the gods and take what you're doing seriously. I, th I would advise you to read up on what you can. And even if it's not with the AFA, if you can find other folkish ousatru are near you, 
you know, maybe they're two, three hours away, but it's worth the drive. Go out and actually meet them. Actually do Alsa True. There's a big divide between the folks that just read the stuff and are academics and the folks that actually practice our religion. And it makes a huge difference when you when you've experienced both of them, the difference is very, very clear. Uh I'll I'll just say Join join the AFA. Um, uh, part partially because uh, I mean Matt Flavel is awesome. I saw a Facebook photo of him. He basically like fits the definition of Chad. Like the <laughs> the, the dude lifts. He was he was drinking protein during break. And come on, he's got like the title of of Chad Warrior Pope. So join the FA, <laughs> AFA. The Chad Flavel and the Virgin other three hosts. Yeah. <laughs> now uh matt you mentioned your website you guys are still using uh runestone.org correct yes okay for the listeners again we- that's runestone r-u-n-e-s-t-o-n-e dot org yep and on there's got links to our contacts it's got links to our kindreds it's got you know a map of where you fall within you know our regions it's a really valuable website. It's also got a blog there. Um, yeah, a lot of information. And like I say, it's got those foundational documents, the Declaration of Purpose and the Statement of Ethics. I think those really give you an idea of what we're about as an organization. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how much of this you could just uh, um, pull off the top of your head. Uh, but what what would be a summary of your your statement of purpose um, and and your your sort of vision for the organization as a whole? Um, I, I mean, are you asking me to generalize our vision, or are you asking for a kind of a rundown of our declaration of purpose? Yes, either. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well. The vision basically is to bring all of our folk home to our ancestral faith of Ausatru. Um, how we go about doing that is uh, is through our, our declaration of purpose, and um, also also with that vision is not only to bring all our folk home, but in a very real and tangible way to make make Ausatru a real thing that folks do. Um, have local things in your community to where you can go to Hoffs, where you can go to a local kindred, and it's treated as a real religion. We're at a point now where we need to evolve away from, you know, a Viking theme party in your backyard to doing real church things that real churches do, and that's really important to us. Basically, our declaration of purpose is uh, we got nine points of it. The first one is to practice, promote and develop and uh, I apologize to practice, promote, develop and disseminate the religion of Ausatru. The second one is the preservation of the ethnic European folk and their continued evolution. Third one, issuing a call to all our brothers and sisters of the ethnic European folk to return to this, their native religion way of life. Four, the restoration of community the banishment of alienation, and the establishment of natural and just relations amongst our folk. Uh, Fifth, the promotion of true diversity amongst the peoples and cultures of the earth. Sixth, the fostering in our people of a deep sense of responsibility and self-reliance. Seven, the use of science and technology for the well-being of our people while protecting and working in harmony with the natural environment in which we live. Eight, the, expo- the exploration of the universe in keeping with the Faustian instinct of our kind. And nine, the affirmation of the struggle of life, welcoming the challenge of that struggle and living life wholly and with joy and facing eternity with courage. Yeah, those, those are all great. And I just want to sort of really draw um, our listeners' attention to it. Anyone who really considers themselves interested in in the concept of of preserving your your own race um and making sure that you don't die out as a cultural and an ethnic people right there in the state in the declaration of purpose the preservation of ethnic european folk and their continued evolution that's that's pretty much the 14 words right there so um definitely get in on this (laughs) 
not not only that but just just everything that makes us great as a people the faustian instinct that sort of god god's given spark that that wisdom to to wander and to seek new horizons you know it's it's not it's not just that that we as as whites need need to exist it's that we need to preserve what makes us us and to to retain everything that makes us unique and in doing so as you say preserve the the only way you pr you preserve diversity global diversity of peoples is by making sure that everyone really embraces what makes a folk a folk and to have a sort of spiritual understanding about that is just invaluable and and to have that be the foundation upon which your religious organization is built upon you you just don't find that anymore in especially not in the abrahamic religions absolutely absolutely now there was uh unless you guys had any follow-ups you on that um i believe Lee, you mentioned that you wanted to get into some of the Indo-European aspects. And now with the Astro Folk Assembly, I understand that they prioritize the Germanic and specifically the Nordic pantheon because that is by far where our best records exist. Um, but there were also some people, I believe, who were interested in the broader Indo-European scope. Matt, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a broad range. I've, I've got a lot of thoughts on that, actually. Uh, one of the most important thoughts that I have on it, when people get involved in this, they immediately see and think Vikings. And those people, while very important, very cool, we all like Vikings, they're a very small snapshot of a belief system that stretches back to the very dawn of our people. And, uh, you know, when you think back on our spirituality, it didn't just start with the Viking Age. It goes back into the deep depths of the Aryan peoples, into that ancient history. It didn't just start with some Viking one day. It's the spiritual story of our existence from the very dawn of history all the way until the future. As long as there's people of our folk in existence, we're all part of that continuing religious tradition. Absolutely. I think one of the very prominent aspects of this, is, and this is actually something I intended to bring up with Tiwaz, is um, the government or the governance of Rome was, and the uh, in the Republic age was largely due to the fact that people and representatives very much feared the wrath of Jupiter if they were not uh, they were not honorable in their actions with their subjects. So I, I certainly agree. It's of long-standing and an invaluable tradition of our folk. And at the same time, like, I, I would say that the pantheons are very similar because the Aryan spirit, despite, you know, uh, national and ethnic differences, it sort of has the same broad strokes. So you can call Odin, Zeus, Peru, and Jupiter, uh, Lou, very much similar concepts all throughout the uh, all throughout Europe. Well, for me, that's this is what drew me into into this in the first place. Is is um, you know the the absolute. I, I think it's from one of Stephen McNallan's writings. I forget which book it is, um, but he's talking about how you know at the time when. Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm remembering wrongly who the author of this piece was, but in one of the books, um, the main books that are sold on the, the AFA website, and you know, there's a there's a chapter in uh, at the beginning of one of these primer sort of primer uh, volumes, <clears throat> where the author is describing, you know, that search for spiritual um, understanding and a connection with the gods and having. Um, attended, um, you know, in the 60s, I believe, you know, a bunch of Native American rituals. And the, you know, the leader of this uh, ritual eventually coming to them and saying, you're not going to find what you're looking for here. You have to drink from your own well. Um, and, 
you know that's I, that that chapter has has been with me ever since I read it the first time and um, the, what what strikes me as most powerful is this concept that um, you know our understanding of the universe it's like even even with even if the Eddas had never been recorded or uh, any of our knowledge of the universe was was totally wiped away my concept of it is that this exists in our the this exists in the archetypal you know aryan understanding it's in our dna this understanding of the universe and how how we relate to the world around us and you know if all of those stories were were um somehow had been wiped away and we never had access to them i think that we would have invented these things ourselves um over time and we may have given them slightly different names and and forms to those myths but i believe that those myths would have come back um just because they they come from our, our they basically stem from our genetic memory um yeah, I think I think you're remembering correctly. That was Stephen McNallan um, in his book uh, *Asatrua: Native European um, Spirituality*. Um, and though we've talked about McNallan in previous episodes, he he is the uh, the founder of the uh, AFA, um, the the individual that uh, Matt Matt Flavel took over for. Um, and yeah, he 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 used to be he was searching for for a new spiritual system and he was you know trying to in intrude on a on a native american um ritual and as, as you say he said no you have to you have to drink from the well of your own people um and I, and i think i think you're also right in that there are sort of archetypal <clears throat> concepts um that that even though we don't have direct contact with with the gods um those those gods are are represented in sort of um archetypes that i mean really read read carl jung to get a better idea of what arc, archetypes are um and it's really hard to to sort of put your finger on where the archetype um uh begins and where where the god begins and where where the blurring is but either either way uh the gods are they they have um a sort of common root meaning uh and and i think what whether whether you call it um uh odin or or whatnot um they're they're real and they're relatable to to someone who would you know like like you say worship jupiter not not because those gods aren't real um concrete deities and entities but because we have archetypes which are related to the gods and which give power to the gods no what i'm saying is that because they are real they live within us they are a part of yeah. us and we we descend from them directly and so it's it's only natural that um um you know that we we just that's why we feel this harmony with this uh these stories and this this uh you know these codes of conduct and um our virtues um that are outlined i mean these are things that men have created the you know the nine noble virtues and such but it's not like they they didn't just i mean in, in a manner of speaking i guess they pulled them out of thin air but through meditation and in harmony with the the concepts which are innate to the european people and um yeah it's, it's um, always hard for me to explain to people yes i believe in odin the god and yes i believe in wotan the jungian archetype i mean th those those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive um and rather than just sort of bumble around that concept what what do you think about that matt like some <coughs> someone approaches you and says like do you really believe that odin is you know riding across the sky on a on an eight-legged horse you know what 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 do you say to to those who would challenge um uh, literalness of your belief. I first, I don't think that our myths were ever meant to be literal truths. That concept is not a concept of our people. That's an Abrahamic concept. Mm -hmm. Our faith has always been literary devices that teach truths with with a big T. They're not meant to be, you know, a reporter documenting an event. 
They're meant to show us in a way that we can visualize the truths of the cosmos and the truths of the divine. Do I believe that, you know, when I do bloat to Odin, that there is someone there that hears what I am saying, that embodies all of those things we believe Odin to, ble to be? Absolutely. Do I feel I exchange in energy with the All Father and he exchanges it back with me and the, the assembled folk? Absolutely. Do I think it's an old guy with a beard and, you know, one eye sitting on a throne somewhere with some wolves and some ravens? No, that picture just, that picture tells me who Odin is. That picture isn't a, you know, a, a, a like a, a crime reporter's sketch of something. Yeah. Yeah, kind of an appeal that I think helps is if any of you or if any of our listeners have ever read the Iliad, you know, that was based on a historical war in very antiquitous uh, Greek history. And it makes appeals to, as was mentioned with Tiwaz, uh, not just the warring forces, but the numinous concepts of their faith that was doing battle with one another. And there are, you know, direct stories within that uh, epic of the gods helping, assisting with one side or the other based on the moral fiber of them. So you can see, you know, there were these records, not perhaps of Zeus coming down and striking the Trojans, but of something very much like that expressed through the fate and through the will of the Aegeans in that case. Hmm. That's just one example, yeah. of course. There are, there are those all over... Uh, pan-European pantheons, and I don't mean to single out that one specifically. It's just a very well-known one that I think helps. No, I think that um, from what I've seen, you know, we've got, we've had a guest on the show, uh, Perquinus, who is like a, a very young guy. He's only, I believe, 19. Who, and he's just like voluminously well-read on, um, you know, the sort of the pan-European uh, you know, uh, the pantheon of, of Indo-Aryan um, religious faiths. And it just, it strikes me that the, the, there is a huge um, growth of um, paganism generally um, from that perspective of, of Indo-European, um, the broader Indo-European and um, within the youth, you know, you know, your, your 18 to 25 year old, um, you know, very young men who are um, coming into the fold, and they, you know, of course, they they find a, a need for spirituality and 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 seeking spiritual meaning, um, and and of course, they find that um, you know the the options that are 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 the standard options which are available to them in the churches and so on are not um, typically um, in harmony with what they know to be the truth of their their uh you know their experience of life and of um you know spiritual matters so um i think that that's the cause that like we've got a huge we've got a large number of people coming into paganism as a general concept um who are very young and who are sort of taking this big umbrella approach uh sort of seeing it as it relates to our origins um and all the, the sort of the cross-cultural um you know, pagan um, um, comparative, you know, religion and and so on, and um, I just think it's fascinating, and it's it's a it's amazing to see it sort of taking shape, and it's really encouraging for not only just for the AFA, but for um, you know that that uh, rebirth of the natural order, you know. Hopefully, uh, you know, to put it in the Vedic sort of frame, you know, like people have talked about coming out of the Kali Yuga, you know, the dark age of the, uh, of, um, you know, the Iron Age where, where knowledge is lost, you know, and, it, and there's, there seems to be a lot of um, thought in paganism right now that, you know, essentially we are coming out of that, that dark uh, age. And um, I think it's only natural that, um, you know, that people will be seeking, you know, a, a, a true connection with their ancestral, um, spiritual heritage as a result. So, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been interested in, I mean, was, was more interested in the er, earlier in my life in the Greco Roman pantheon. Um, I was also got interested in the Indo Aryan, um, uh, 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 
Hindu, Hindi aspect of things, but at the end of the day, you got you got to come to a place where people are building real communities, because that's where the gods sort of express their their essence and their will and make the, and they through us they gain power and we gain power through them um so any anyone that really is is sort of creating a community family and folk around spirituality at the end of the day that's where i'm gonna go and that's where i'm gonna get my power and that's where some of the um legitimate claims of christianity are like the yes you know i'm sure jupiter and zeus are interesting but you know you there are no churches to to zeus but now thanks to the afa there actually are um spiritual communities and even spiritual places of worship um i was wondering uh matt could you could you talk about uh hoffs um uh i, I believe you uh just did a project on building one um uh, what was that what was that like absolutely um well <clears throat> we didn't build one per se but we acquired a hoff two years ago we bought an old grange hall I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the Grangers, but mm -mm. they're an organization largely selling off a lot of their buildings. So we're able to find a really good deal on this old building built in 1938, and it met our needs perfect. Uh, you know, had a big hall we could meet in, it had an industrial kitchen that you know we could feed all of our folks in because feasting is so important to you know tradition of do. It really was a, a perfect find. Sheila McNallan just poured her efforts into trying to find this place. And so finally we were able to, to get this spot figured out. And with the generous donations of our folk, we were able to raise quite a bit of money to put a down payment on it. So, you know, looking at Ausatru over the last 45 years, it's always been the dream to get land and get a hoff. And a real Hoff. There have been a lot of people that have, you know, built a structure in their backyard or a relatively small structure and used it for a, for their own personal Hoff in a place of worship. And those are fantastic. Um, please don't get me wrong, but this building is is like what you'd want to see as far as as far as a real church that you'd go to somewhere. And having that having that solid real place that's holy sacred ground of our own. It's very profound if you can go there. Feeling that you get finally having that spot that's ours. It's hard to describe if you haven't been there, but I encourage folks to make that trip out sometime because it's really a special thing. The AFA would really like to uh, get Hoffs all over. One of the things that a lot of folks do is, is every kindred of you know three or four guys in their backyard, the first thing they want to do is let's buy some land and let's let's get some boards and nail them together and build a hoff. And it's a lot more work than I think a lot of people realize. I genuinely believe the fastest route to get a Hoff in your area is to help the AFA with the Hoffs that we're starting. Because as soon as we get this one down, as soon as it's paid off, we're going to be looking at that Hoff number two, after that number three. And there's no end in sight into how many we'd like to build to where we have a place of worship in as many places as we can where we have folk trying to honor our God. Um, You'd mention oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, um, where would uh, Hoff number two and number three theoretically be? And uh, the, the, basic, the basis for that question is, regionally, um, where are your uh, strong points, um, just in case someone might be in a, in a hotbed of, of, of kindred activity and not know it? Well, you know, these kind of things change over time as things progress. So depending on how long it takes us to pay off the Hoff we have now, the landscape could change to where we have very strong communities. Uh, I can't say for certain where we'd, where we'd build the second Hoff. A lot of things have to do with what kind of support structure we have in the locality as far as people will be able to maintain it, and also where we can find the best price and the best value for, for our investment. If you're looking for where we've got the most active regions in the AFA right now, Certainly in Northern California, we've got a very active region, followed by uh, Virginia, North Carolina area, what we call the AFA's Upper South, which is like Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina there, um, Maryland too, I believe. We have a really, 
really strong growth there over this last year, year and a half, and it's been really impressive to watch. Another area that's a fantastic area for us these last couple of years has been what we call the Northern Plains, kind of the Dakotas and then Minnesota. Tremendous activity there. I just returned from an event up there, Fall Fest in Minnesota. Fantastic. A ton of people came out, and they're some of our very best folk. Uh, maybe surprising to some folks, one of our up-and-coming regions that's really cool is is Sweden. We've got quite a few members now in Sweden. Our folk over there, our folk builder over there, Anders Nilsson, he is he has really built quite a quite a group from for himself over the past I'd say year now. So that's really impressive to watch that grow. Well, they need it. They do, and and that's one of the other things over there. I'm really happy. With. A lot of efforts we've had in Europe in the past, the people have seemed uh, fairly fairly subdued and fairly uncomfortable with folkishness. And uh, a lot of the fight, I think, has been beaten out of those people. In Sweden, our folk over there are very strong. They absolutely get it. They're strongly folkish. They're not afraid to take a stand for their people. And it's, it's really something cool to see. So... Um Hmm. Let's see. How do I approach this question? Because I believe one of, one of the goals of a religion is to protect its people, to protect its um, its flock, as it were, to use a, a Christian word. Um, however, when when your people are being threatened, um, and your religion and your culture are being threatened, um, what what do you what do you do as because because uh, you know our our uh, our ancestors probably didn't have as much of a uh, a division between um religion and politics for for them it was just how you lived your life and how you interacted with the world but now we do have this sort of um a division where one much must not touch the other so if if he, for for example your 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 guy in uh, Sweden if if he sees uh, the 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 government trying to crack down on on his on his kindred and or or his people and if he sees you know invaders you know like doing very bad things to to his his folk I mean what what sort of a recourse do you have as far as trying to support people without sort of infringing on um uh the political neutrality of of your position in that nation well and the answer is something what you don't do is nothing um the first step is acknowledging that your people are a thing and that, that there's something of in your folk. And from there, it depends case by case on what you do. Um, one of the things that I think really hurts our people is their own little backyard organization and that limits our ability to work, look out for everybody's and to take care of each other. Um, Networks you to a support system of people that can try to help you out. Now, it would depend on. Oh, shit. It sounds like, Matt, it sounds like your connection is cutting out or your mic is uh, maybe unplugging a little bit or something. We're, we're really cutting out bad. Um, hopefully, you can jump back in in just a second. <clears throat> um, Ooh. Yeah, I, I, I was hoping that was just me. Um, one, yeah. one thing I definitely did get was, um, you don't do nothing. Yeah. Um, and you definitely don't sabotage the, the efforts of your, of your people. One, one thing I was going to bring up in, in regards to that is, um, in South Africa, I mean, whites there really are facing a genocide and they are being directly attacked, not just by the government, um, but but by you know the hostile uh, indigenous quotes finger quotes um african population um and and the whites there are very 
very Christian. And um, what they are doing is is nothing and very often worse than nothing because and i think this this is sort of a problem with more universal religions is that they they say well this this is not a religion for a folk this is not a religion for a people this religion views equally the the african and the the saudi lander so i don't know, even the, see skin color yeah so so any any time any religion that doesn't believe in in a, an identity for its people uh it it can it can create problems it's going to eventually uh become i don't i don't want to say parasitic because that might be too triggering a word but it it might it might hold a people back if it denies the identity of a people Is is Matt still here? I see him there online, but I I haven't heard him chime in for a little bit. So, can you guys hear me now? Yes, yes, yes we can. All right, I've unplugged my headphone and I'm I'm back with you on the computer here. Sorry for the break up there. Um, I know we've moved on in the topic a little bit, but I think one of the keys to the the whole do something, not do nothing, you have to have a pride in yourself and a pride in your folk and who you are and where you come from. That's true of white people, but that's true of any people. There's a dignity in honoring your ancestors, your gods, and your people. You have a right to exist. Not only do you have a right to exist, but you have a right to thrive. And you have a right to want victory for yourself and your people. You need a group of people to do that. But the more of our people that wake up to our faith, that wake up to identifying themselves as a group and taking pride in who they are and where they come from, the more we can begin to stand up, stand together, and uh, carve out a place in this world for ourselves. It's very important, and the more we can can work together, the better we can achieve that. The more we uh, we balkanize over minute issues, the harder time we're going to have getting anything accomplished that's for the good of our fold. Here, here. Um, do we want to uh, segue into in the news? Um, I actually think I have a pretty good transition point. Yeah, um, I, I think it's about news time. Leek, did you have anything you wanted to add before? No, I, I just want to say that we're, we're on a pretty short time now until the end. Um, so we'll have to sort of uh, pick our news topics as uh, be picky about them because we're getting on the end and um, I've got an early morning tomorrow morning so I can't, I can't hang out too long so. okay um, well uh, we'll we'll make uh, this this transition one pretty short because it's kind of just playing off what I was saying about um, the the South African Sudi Sudi landers um, landers yeah sorry Swede Swede landers um, there was a reversal of the Dylan Ruth um, church shooting. Uh, a, a black guy pulled pulled and pulled a Dylan Roof in a in a white church, um, mowed mowed someone down. Seven were wounded. Um, only one was killed. Um, and though though we can you know sort of poo poo Christianity in general, this we we still have to sort of honor the concept of folk we can't attack our own people just because they don't have the connection with the gods that we do far from it we often should pity um those who are still uh slaves to a foreign foreign ideology because these would in other times be our brothers so when they are attacked gunned down and the our our mainstream culture and media just gives a collective shrug and tries to memory hold that hold that we cannot accept that very often christians won't be the best defenders of themselves when they're attacked by um a, a member of another race because they are afraid to say no we are 
a people and we have a, a concrete identity and we're being attacked in a way that has nothing to do with abstract ideological concepts we are being attacked physically attacked in real life and we are in danger when when they don't say that we have to be willing to say that Yeah, and I mean, not even just for uh, Christianity specifically, for all of our folk, you know. Um, it's not just Christians who maybe aren't uh, aren't very receptive to saying that, but a lot of the people who are victims of multiculturalism kind of need somebody to say, fuck multiculturalism. And we, as people who see and who have the strength and the courage to acknowledge the truth, have a responsibility, therefore, to go through with that. I think this is really important. One thing I believe very strongly, and we try to practice as much as possible in the Astro Folk Assembly, is be the example, be the hero. We have There's a lot of things in this world we don't have control over, but the one thing we do have control over is ourselves, our actions, and uh, you know what we present to the world. So trying each of us as best as we can to be the best version of ourselves we can be and collectively be the best version of our our groups we can be that really does inspire other people and it i think that's one of the most accessible things we can do today to change our destiny better here here so i believe our a, a next um uh, story on the docket was uh the the success of of the uh, AFD um, in in Germany the the AFD became officially the third most successful party. They gained um, I'll say the truth. They gained twelve point something percent of the vote, um, and I think thirteen seats. Um, there was a meme going around that they gained fourteen percent of the vote and eighty-eight seats. So that, that that unfortunately wasn't quite true. That that would have been some interesting uh, meme magic, I suppose. Well, um, I think despite but, coming in slightly under that with the percentage, they got something like ninety-four, ninety-five seats. So. Yeah. Works works out so, in the end. Yeah. And the the thing I I, I had in, in interest in saying though is when you suppress the um identity of people, not just um uh in in the more uh mundane aspects, but the, the spiritual identity of the pe of a people, it's gonna come back. The the will the Faustian will to fight and struggle and find the roots of the root of of your ancestors and your people it it can it can only be suppressed for too long and if you if you try and keep keep a lid on that pot when it's you know heating up it's it's going to boil over and not always in the most um uh peaceful of manners so i would advise merkel to um give her people a voice <laughs> I'd, advise, I'd advise Michael to get the fuck out of Dodge. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, there's kind of an Odinic and kind of a tier element to this as well. You know, uh, Germany, whatever people might say about their past, they've had some very proud, very strong movements. And the, the death of those, in a way, and the death of the German spirit, which ensued from that, uh, sort of indicates a... Uh, an ascension to Valhalla, if you will, but at the same time, uh, the the great injustices which have been done to Germany and their history for at least the past hundred years or so, slightly over, um, has basically been uh, just a long and ongoing series of injustices. And I think that we are about to see sort of a uh, quite a reverse on that. You know, that was Jung's whole concept whole concept with the Wotan essay is that, you know, the Germanic spirit wants to be as benevolent as possible, but is as malevolent as needed. So the AFD, it made some slight gains, and it seems calm now. But we've also seen that uh, it, it has a lot more room to grow, for one thing. The second largest gains were made by the German Libertarian Party, and we've seen what happens to libertarians when they kind of stew in their own ideas for two or three years. And also, uh, 
a lot of our gains are coming from the CDU or the conservative party, and they're still in the lead. So AFD, I think, has the potential to be a dominating force in Germany within the next decade. And not only that, but they're also they're also purging or self-purging even some of the cuck aspects leaving of their own accord, uh, particularly if we, as we've seen with Freud Petri. Um, yeah, I don't, it's a very in-depth topic and we're kind of running low on time. So if you guys uh, had anything else you wanted to add on that, go right ahead. I'll, I'll just quickly plug um, the Wotan network by uh, Stephen McNowan. Um, just, just Google it. The Wolf Age um, is upon us and Wotan is awakening and we are going to be there to uh, sort of guide that that uh, reawakened spiritual energy. Hail. All right. Um, Did we have a third on the docket? One other thing I had was we can maybe get something from this NFL thing. Obviously, you know, uh, Proud nationalists maybe aren't too sympathetic to either side of this issue, and we're maybe uh, most primarily interested with just kind of watching the whole thing burn. But I think there's also an underlying motif in this as to the importance of recognizing the symbols of your own folk. And we're seeing a lot of concept because there have been tried to make uh, unifying symbols, uh, universal symbols, and just hoisting symbols to people whom they don't belong and we're seeing a disastrous effect of that we're seeing that it's you know ultimately going to collapse and uh yeah that's pretty much it that's why we emphasize drinking from our own well so to speak i think um what is happening with the nfl is wonderful because it's been said very often that that fans become fanatic and then sort of have a sort of religious ecstasy with certain games uh, and and it's always described in 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 a in a sort of spiritual way that some fans have connection with with these players who have no connection with you or your ancestors or even as we are now seeing with your culture so what we had was a certain subversive intertribal element within our culture that took away our identity and our ability to say we are a people we have a culture and a belief system and a spiritual system we were not allowed to have that anymore at least nothing authentic but they did give us fake substitutes um fake idols as it were and the nfl was part of that they you you were allowed to glom on to a team and that was your your identity your spiritual identity and that that is a that is dying our fake gods are are being um discarded by our people and uh i think that is um something to be uh, celebrated Absolutely. Lee, you've been kind of quiet for a while. Anything in the news that you want to specify? Well, um, I mean, the one thing that really brings it back to the tear rune for me is just that uh, the Nordic resistance movement in Sweden had a big rally um, on Saturday. And of course, they used the tear rune as their uh, the symbol of their movement. So, um I just wanted to draw attention to that. I think that, I mean, um, yeah, it's it's amazing the developments that we see happening and everything seems to happen so fast and uh, it's almost hard to keep up with it all at times. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm ready to move on if you guys are. Hail them. Um, okay, so I guess we're at the, the, the end of the second hour here and we're ready to... to um, close out the show with our, our weekly sumble. Um, now, I, I have a feeling that we will be having quite a few new listeners this week because, um, again, I think this is a, this should be our first episode on the TRS radio network. Um, and so I just wanted to say to 
you know introduce those new listeners to this um, custom we have at the end of our episodes where we do a form of a sort of a, a digital symbol and a, a symbol traditionally maybe i should let matt describe it but um my understanding is of uh you know a ritual event wherein people gather often around a, a, a roaring fire and um take turns um you know, making a toast, a both boast or oath around the fire and um, giving honor to some action they've taken or something that they want to praise in somebody else in the community or uh, honoring, um, you know, a toast to one of the gods or, or somebody else of influence. And um, so each of our episodes, we do a, a digital symbol, as I said, and um, the uh, you know the goal with Midgard Rising and, and our podcast has always been to um, you know sort of act as a gateway into a lot of these customs for people who might be um, seeing them for the first time or or sort of just like dipping a toe into um, this way of thinking. So you know our what we do here is you know it's. It, of course, it's hard to convey the true power of a, of a real ritual symbol you know, over a podcast in one round. But um, our goal here is to just sort of to to introduce people to that and give them sort of an entry point into, you know, what these rituals actually look like and, and feel like. Um, so um, with that said, um, we take a, a fairly somber uh, view of our symbols and put ourselves in a, in a serious frame of mind in order to um, you know, give the full, uh, you know, give full importance to, you know, the words that are being said. Each person um, will make a, a boast of some great accomplishment, um, a toast to someone who's achieved something or a god that they wish to honor, um, or make an oath that they, um, you know, they swear to uphold uh, before their community. And um, so, Normally in a sambal, I believe it would go around several times. Um, you would have the opportunity to make, you know, do several rounds of, of this. Um, and yet, so, but yet on our, on our podcast, of course, we just do a single round and, um, we've each chosen something to, um, to toast or uh, boast about, um, on the episode. So um. I'll, I'll begin this, uh, week's sambal, um, I think it's fitting because I, I do, again, I've, I've heard word that will be carried by the TRS radio network. Um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about how that is a significant thing for me. Um, because a few years back, um, I was making my transition into alt-right politics and identity, and I found references to the right stuff on 4chan and other various places on the internet. And, um, Anyway, if you're not familiar, 4chan's uh, politically incorrect board is it's basically a writhing sea of opinions, um, verbal diarrhea of sorts, where one is able to um, occasionally find pearls of wisdom. I first, you know, through 4chan and the posts on that board um, is when I first began tuning into the Right Stuff Radio Network. Um, and in doing so, it was like passing through a veil from this stormy writhing sea of piss that can be image board culture um wherein the you know there's a tiny diamond in the rough of uh all of this you know writhing um you know content that's on there into clear-headed yet hilarious worldview um at that time the trs forum was by invitation only and i used the main trs email address to pester uh, Sven, Seven Son, um, repeatedly and lay out my case for admission. Um, in doing so, I was heartfelt, sincere, and uh, was actually utterly ignored in my first several attempts to get his attention. Um, but I just kept at it and made it a, a number of appeals and finally um, was invited by Sven. 
Um, since then, I've made friends and real life connections. I've come to realize that I'm not alone in a world gone mad. I've connected with my fellow countrymen as well as with my spiritual brethren. I found ways to contribute and put my energies to use within our movement. Where before this energy was spent in despair f for my solitude, seeing the realities of, of this insane world that we live in, um, it's now filled with hope for our people. So tonight my toast is to Mike Enoch and Seventh Son and all those who have worked to make the TRS network what it is today. They've walked a path from hobby level shit posters to professionals and it has been a pleasure to be a part of their contribution to our race. Tonight I honor them for creating a platform which has allowed so many of us to connect. May their paywall subscriptions flow freely. To Mike and Sven. To Mike and Sven. To Mike and Sven. I, in fact, also intended to make a toast to the TRS radio network. Um, perhaps I'm not going to go as in-depth in the history aspect, but much along the same lines, you know, I, uh, I encountered them through poll. I, I would be very deep in despair by now, uh, just swimming in the black pills, but their humor their wisdom, their perseverance, their work, everything they've done to bring a disaffected uh, race, generation, an entire folk to fruition, which now uh, has guided me to betterment through so many aspects of my life. I also give toast to the TRS radio network and those who, uh, to those who have created and sustain it. Hail. Hail TRS. Hail. So, I am going to raise a toast to our guest, Matt Flavel. Um, the AFA, under Matt Flavel's guidance, guidance has in entered a new and active era, while at the same time honoring the legacy of Stephen McNallan. Matt gives power to the European folk while also giving power to the gods, each each feeding the other. He is a fighter, proven to be so, but is also wise and measured. Um, we just did an entire episode with him, so I'm sure our, our uh, listeners know my reasons and agree to a toast to Matt Flavel, the AFA. May Tyr give you strength and Odin give you wisdom. I thank you guys very much. Uh, I'd like to raise this bottle to my host this evening. It's been an honor to be on your guys' program. I really like what you're doing. The level of discourse that you're having on these topics is next level, and it's the depth that I'd like to see all our folk be able to discuss our beliefs, our ancestry, and, and our gods on. It's really impressive to see your guys' program and with your new launch with the TRS system. I wish you guys the very best of luck. So, uh, hail to my host, hail to Midgard Rising. To Midgard Aww. Rising. To Midgard, Midgard Rising. Rising. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in to this, our 18th episode of Midgard Rising. Um, you can contact us uh, on our email, um, which is midgardrising at protonmail.com. You can find us on SoundCloud and on MixCloud, um, possibly coming soon to some other platforms. Um, and you will very soon find us on the TRS Radio Network front page. Um, thank you once again for joining in. Um, I'm not, again, because of that copyright issue I mentioned before, I'm not exactly sure what I have in store yet. Hold for, on. Yeah, go I, ahead. I have a solution. Tell me. I was, I was actually thinking of uh, toasting you, League, but I decided not to. Um, it is uh, our... our uh, League leagues hits his birthday, <laughs> um, and and he's he's the one who does who does all the uh, 
the the technical work on this this episode without him you know i probably wouldn't wouldn't even remember when when the episode is sometimes <laughs> i still don't um so so he's he's a integral part to this so um i propose a bonus toast to league with closing out happy birthday the song <laughs> encore <laughs> Well, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate All right. it. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, Leaf. <laughs> Happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> very good, guys. Thank you very much. This is what they just allow gonna... on TRS now. Yeah, top-notch entertainment right here. Um, fantastic. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Matt. We really appreciate you coming on, and um, yeah, what you know, we're we're sincere in what we're doing, and you know, the whole reason is to to help try to bring more people into uh, into us the true and um, you know this the system of of thinking. Um, you know, people lost sort of in the in the uh, in the darkness, as it were. So um, we really appreciate you coming on. It sort of it lends us a little bit of credibility, and um, we're happy to promote what what uh, the AFA is doing as well. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys having me on your program. Like I say, it's a big honor to be here. It's an honor to be able to speak to your audience, and I really like what you guys are doing. So thank you for having me.